Hi, my lobitos. This is Mrs. Villarreal, your librarian. And for the past couple of weeks, we've been going on a journey where we've been researching and listening and learning about African-American men and women who have not only struggled, but overcame their struggles to accomplish great and wonderful things to make this nation what it is. Okay, and before we end uh, Black History Month, I'd like us to talk about one more group of people called the Jubilee Singers. And the name of this book is called A Band of Angels. Now, this book is written by Deborah Hopkinson and Raul Colon. And I'm not going to read it this time. Usually I read you the book and talk about it. But I'm going to let some other special people read the book to you today. And I want to give a shout out for the kinder through sixth graders at Twain who uh, participated in reading this book. They read the story, uh, did the music, and even the sound effects. So I hope you enjoy this story, uh, especially because it talks about Jubilee. And the word Jubilee in the story, it says... It's a time of hope and freedom, and now that time has begun, and it did. It not only began for the special singers, who I'm going to name right now, Benjamin, Jenny, Green, Eliza, Thomas, Minnie, Ella, Isaac, and Maggie. These group of singers, boys and girls, changed the lives of thousands of freed uh African-American people, and even today, they are, uh, their contributions and their sacrifice for what they did is helping thousands of people get a good quality education. So I, this story is about Ella Shepard, and you're probably thinking, hmm, who is Ella Shepard? Well, Ella Shepard was born a slave in Nashville in 1851. I'm not going to give too much more away because uh, we have some wonderful students who narrated the story and are going to read it to you. But what I want you to understand, boys and girls, is that you may have a circumstance. You may be in a difficult situation, but you know what? You can overcome it. So I want you never, ever to give up. And I want you to keep going after your dream. Keep going after what you want. And listen to how these brave men and women overcame their obstacles to truly become Jubilee singers in a band of angels. I hope you enjoy the story. And a special thanks to Mr. Guerra for putting all of this together. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Mr. Guerra. And thank you, Twain students for doing this for us a band of angels a story inspired by the jubilee cinders by deborah hopkinson my aunt beth tells herself a treasure keeper her treasures are the stories about our family she keeps in her heart of all these treasures my favorite is the story of my great great grandmother ella grandma ella was born into slavery and beth always begins but no one could chain her voice. Everyone said singing was part of that child the way the swallows are part of the sky. As Aunt Beth talks, I close my eyes and try to imagine a girl long ago who loved to sing. I see her slipping into a empty church to patches on the old piano there. She thinks she's alone, but everyone talks by outside stops to hear her song. When Ella was 14, the Civil War and slavery ended at last. It was now the law that everyone, black or white, could get an education. But most schools and colleges were still only for white people. So when Ella heard about the new school for freed slaves in Nashville Fisk School, she wanted with all her heart to go, but she had no money to pay for it. And it began to keep a jar for coins, filling with money she'd earn any way she could. At weddings, Ella played the piano. She scrubbed clothes for a few pennies, yet when the time came for her school to start, she'd only saved six dollars. She packed her things in a trunk anyway and hired a wagon to take her to Nashville. As Aunt Bill tells about the journey, I see Ella perched high on that wagon seat, eager for her first sight of Fisk School. 
when its shabby wooden buildings appear before her, she's not even disappointed. And she's too excited to go to school at last. The first person Ella met at school was Professor George White, the music teacher, Aunt Bess says. She held out her money to him. I'm afraid this is only enough for three weeks, he told her. Ella must have felt discouraged standing before him with her little trunk, no bigger than a pie box, at her feet. But she didn't let that stop her. She just kept working to make those three weeks longer and longer. She washed dishes and waited on tables in the dining hall. She gave music lessons to children in town. And late at night, when everyone else was asleep, she sat up with a basket of medding. I imagine Ella, head bent over her work, needle flashing in the light lamp, a book prop up on the table so she can study while she sews. And I know my great great grandmother had a love of her learning inside her that glowed like a warm bright flame. No matter how tired Ella was, she was always ready for music at the turn out. The first time Professor White heard her singing, he invited her to join the school chorus. It wasn't long before she was playing the piano for the singers, too. Soon, they had learned many classical pieces and popular songs of the day white people sing. But the chorus sang the old slave songs, too, didn't they? I asked. Shh, white. And Beth laughs. We haven't got to that part yet. It was rainy that fall and the roofs leaked. The students' rooms were cold and damp. One night after practice, Professor White had bad news for the singers. Our buildings won't last much longer, he said, and there's no money to fix them or build new ones. Unless something can be done, this school will close. All Ella's friends were working hard to pay for school. Jenny Jackson took in washing, Benjamin Holmes was a tailor, Green Evans did odd jobs like painting and hauling gravel. If Fisk closed, they'd have no place to study. Their dreams for a brighter day would be lost. Sometimes songs arise from happiness, sometimes from sorrow. When Ella heard the news about her school, her heart was so heavy she just had to sing. She remembered a song she learned as a little girl, a song from slavery days. By then, few people were singing the old songs and some were even being forgotten. They reminded people of their pain, of the hard days of slavery, but they were about hope too. So Ella began to sing. Sing for me now, Aunt Beth, I whisper. Aunt Beth holds me close and we sing together. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for the caramel. Swing low, sweet cherry up. Coming for the caramel. Coming for the caramel. Now comes a part of the story I like best. What happened next, I ask, though I already know. Did the school close? The school leaders were ready to give up, but not Professor Wright. He thought of a way he and the singers could help. Our course is as good as any in the country, he declared, and I believe people will buy tickets to hear us sing. If we give concerts up north, we can use the money to buy a new school. Are you willing to try? Ella spoke for all of them. Of course we will. I think about how frightened Grandma Ella must have been before that long journey. She had never ridden on train or been up north before. How she must have shivered in her thin coat and cloth shoes. But I also think Ella made herself be brave. The whole school was counting on them. As they traveled from town to town, those nine young singers faced many hardships. Um, Beth told me often they were turned away from restaurants because their skin was black. On one stormy evening, no hotel would take them in. They trudged through the rain until at last someone let them stay in a leaky shed. Ella slept wrapped in her coat trying to keep warm. The chorus sang only the popular white songs they thought audiences wanted like Annie Laurie and Home Sweet Home. Night after night, Ella would put on her fine dress, her face hopeful. But night after night, she would look out to see just a few people in a dark, empty hall. Aunt Beth's words make me feel like crying. And then I wonder if my grandma Ella cried too when no one was looking. Professor White didn't want to do bat, but he didn't know what else to do. One evening, before they went on stage, he spoke to the seniors. We did the best anyone could, but I'm afraid we must go home tomorrow, he said. We haven't been able to raise even $500, and our school needs 5000 The seniors stood together without speaking. 
Then, Ella turned slowly and walked across the lightened stage to take her place at the piano. The others filed in. Ella rested her fingers on the keys, wondering if this was the last time they'd ever did the scene together. Everyone in the hall was watching, waiting for her to begin. She took a deep breath, and somehow, at that moment, she found the courage to reach inside her heart and bring forth her own song. In the silent hall, her voice rained out clear and strong. No more auction block for me. No more, no more. No more auction block for me. How surprised Ella's friends were. This wasn't the popular melody they were supposed to sing. It was a song about the end of slavery, a song of freedom. And it was the first time they'd ever sung one of their own songs before an audience. The singers hesitated, but Ella's voice seemed to lift them up with, with her. And as their voices joined hers, the streams flowing in it into a deep river. They could feel everyone in the hall leaning forward to listen. When the song ended, there was only silence. Afterwards, some people said it had been like hearing a band of angels. Others found themselves in tears. All at once, the hall erupted with shouts and cheers and applause. Professor White was smiling and clapping too. Sing another of the old songs, Ella. They want to hear more. Aunt Beth said that from that night on, Grandma Ella and her friends always sang the powerful songs of sorrow and courage they'd learned from their parents and grandparents. They called them spirituals, or jubilee songs, because the word jubilee meant a time of hope and freedom. And now that time had begun. The Jubilee Singers became such a success that they were invited to sing for thousands of people all over the United States and Europe. They even sang at the White House for President Grant and in England for Queen Victoria. Grandma Ella and the Jubilee Singers traveled together for seven years, bringing back enough money to make their small school into Fisk University. Its most beautiful building is called Jubilee Hall. Inside, in a palace of honor, hangs the painting of Grandma Ella and the singers. Whenever I see her pound face there, I feel like singing, too. Today, there was a still Jubilee singers who keep the old songs alive and share them with people all over the world. As the story ends, Aunt Beth is quiet, thinking about the past. I put my hands in hers. When I grew up, I want to be a Jubilee singer just like Grandma Ella. Aunt Beth smiles. Yes, but Grandma Ella would want you to know something else too. I know exactly what that is. Grandma Ella worked so hard seeing that she never had a chance to finish her studies. None of those brave Jubilee singers graduated from the school they loved. But I will. <laughs>